Hi, uh, my name is Suin Lee uh, from the University of Washington Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering. It's uh, super exciting for me to speak about my group's effort on explainable AI um, in this um, Computational Genomics Summer Institute. So um, these days in precision medicine, we try to solve a prediction problem. So how does it work? For each patient, we first obtain a set of features and use some machine learning model to predict uh, some clinical outcome. And many of us know how to predict any outcome accurately. And, but what this way of using machine learning cannot really do is to answer a natural, important question about why a certain prediction was made. Even the ML expert who developed the system may say it's just AI magic, okay? So an important missing piece here is the explanations. So for instance, it doesn't tell you why the features selected by the model make sense. Also, which features mainly contributed to the prediction result. So these explanations are really important because they can give us some information about appropriate clinical actions or biological mechanisms, depending on what the prediction task is. Okay? So this let us identify the following three research problems we need to address to actually advance the field. First is that we want to learn interpretable feature representation especially when we use high dimensional molecular data, such as gene expression data, we sometimes want to pre-select features to begin with, instead of using all 20,000 gene expression levels, the features that are likely to give meaningful explanations of the outcome. And then we can use prior knowledge on that. And then also, when we use a time series data, for instance, data from patient monitoring system, we need to transform them into a form which a machine learning model can take as an input, and then we want these transformed features to be relevant to the prediction tasks and still be interpretable. And sometimes we need to deal with a situation where not all features are collected at the same time. So for instance, for trauma patients, we are now talking about precision medicine, so say that there is a trauma patient some features from dispatchers report come first, and some from paramedics in ambulances or ER next, and then some are measured later on. And then how can then make an accurate prediction fast on the certain things, such as bleeding disorder? Okay? Um, and then, well, in that kind of situation. And we also sometimes need to select the features that have a maximum information about all the other features, okay? unsupervised feature selection. And then second, we want to make interpretable predictions from complex black box models, such as deep neural networks, ensemble models, and so on. And then to do that, we can try to estimate the importance of each feature on a particular prediction so that we can reveal individualized risk factors, explanations, and their interactions to help make better clinical decisions. And then, um, if we can learn these explanations accurately, then how about we use the opportunity to learn the model better, train the model better by regularizing these explanations. That creates a new area okay, of a problem. So to address these problems, my lab, our group, um, develop interpretable machine learning techniques and apply them to various biomedical problems, such as prediction and decision systems, support systems for hospitals, based on EHR data, electronic health record data, cancer precision medicine to enable personalized drug selection for individual cancer patients, and Alzheimer's disease, for which there aren't any drugs at all. So we aim to discover therapeutic targets. And our research covers the spectrum from basic drug discovery for poorly understood disease like Alzheimer's disease to very specific treatment recommendations for better um, understood diseases. And then um, 
the machine learning techniques we are developing are mostly general and can be applied to other kinds of problems. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the first part. So it's about surgery and anesthesia. So surgery and anesthesia are the integral part of healthcare, and but it, they they pose a considerable risk of complications and even death. And in this project, we focused on unwanted physiological condition called hypoxemia. Uh, it means low blood oxygen level okay, that causes a serious patient harm. If hypoxemia can be predicted before it occurs, then anesthesiologists can take actions to proactively prevent hypoxemia and then minimize the patient harm. Okay. For that, we developed a machine learning technique called the prescience that uh, predicts near-term risk of hypoxemia during surgery, and then, and then it does more than that. It explains the factors that led to that risk. So how does it work? It takes input, 20, uh, takes as input about 20 static features, such as a surgical procedure, age, uh, weight, demographic information, ASA um, code, and then diagnostic code, and so on, and then 45 dynamic features such as real-time minute-by-minute information from patient monitors such as heart rate, blood oxygen levels, and so on. And then it makes a real-time prediction um, in a form of a numeric representation of risk. So in this case, the example is a 2.4 odds ratio um, uh, within the next five minutes. We are predicting the future, not the present. Okay, five minutes. Uh, and then its key feature is the ability to explain why a certain prediction was made. So in this example, it shows that the risk is due to the patient's BMI, which by the way is not modifiable. How can you change BMI more during the surgery? It's a couple of hours. It's, a, it's more for like longer term, right? Like kidney disease, whether you get kidney disease after two years, right? And then current tighter volume, it means the amount of air exhaled per, uh, per breath okay? and per rate. And then these explanations can be clinically meaningful because some of these factors may be modifiable and could result in clinical changes to mitigate the risk. So how do we build this model? For any machine learning model, we first need training data. And our collaborators Bala and Jerry, they acquired the AIMS data. It's really amazing data. It has 150 procedures from Utah Medical Center and Harvard View Medical Center. And then using these training data, my recent PhD graduate, Scott, learned various kinds of prediction models and measured each model's performance, prediction performance on a new held out data. We know how to do this. We used um, cross-validation and then drew this um, ROC curves. So um, because we had to choose the you know, best performing model in terms of the prediction accuracy, we compared across different uh, prediction models. So, um, and then we found that two best performing models are linear model, which is a simple model, and then it's a very interpretable. Basically, the weight of this linear model will tell you which features are important. Okay. And then, GBM, gradient boosting machine, which represents a complex model. It's um, a decision tree ensemble model, and um, it's you know, often considered to be a black box. And then, well, as you can see, the tree ensemble model significantly is significantly better than the linear model. Okay? So this is a very common situation in machine learning. I mean, the trade-off between accuracy and interoperability. So with large modern data sets, the best accuracy is often achieved by complex models, even experts struggle to interpret. And then to resolve this challenge, we developed a machine learning technique um, to estimate the, each feature's importance for a particular prediction made on a particular patient. So this is patient specific, okay? sample specific. So our method, we named the SHAB. I'm gonna to explain to you why we named the SHAB. Uh, it's based on, based on uh, shapely, shapely value, which uh, James Joe um, uh, talked about earlier. It's a general machine learning framework that can be applied to any model. It doesn't matter whether you're using tree ensemble or deep learning, deep neural network. 
And then it has three desirable uh, theoretical properties, which other uh, existing methods um, in this domain do not. And then its ability to provide simple explanations of uh, predictions uh, from arbitrarily complex models eliminates the trade the typical trade-off between accuracy and interpretability, and this would allow broader application of machine learning to medicine. Okay, so uh, then you know. By the way, how does it work exactly? Then, okay, how do you give you this give this like numeric you know score to each of the features? So to show that, let's consider a simple intuitive example, not about medicine or anesthesia, and then um, so. Uh, let me know if this is not intuitive enough. Okay? I'm sure it is. So this is John, a typical bank customer. And then like many customers today, when he applies for a loan, this information is sent through some predictive model. Okay? This model is designed to calculate the risk that John will have with some repayment problem, which unfortunately for John, it's a 55% and then the bank declines the, his loan application. Natural first question is why? Okay, again, it's a AI magic. It's all AI magic. So to explain his denier, it is important to start with the base rate of loan uh, repayment problem. What is the chance um, that you know a typical you know anyone um, has this problem? And then denoted here by the expected value of the model outcome. Given no feature, what is the frequency of uh, having this uh, problem? So to, but the, to explain the Jones risk, which is much higher, we need to explain how we got from the base risk, base rate 20%, to his rate, his risk of 55%. Okay? How did we get there? That's, that gives you explanation, right? So. To do this, so we start at the expected value of the model output and then condition on a single feature. So first of all, John's age, okay? Since this increases John's risk by 15%, we attribute that increase, 15%, to John's age. So that's the importance of this feature, okay? If it's more than that, age is more important. Next, we condition on John's occupation, which is not the most stable job these days. And then, um, again, attribute the change in the expected model output to his as, 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 occupation as a day trader. We repeat this for his open account and then capital gain, and then we end up conditioning on all the features. And then we arrive at 55% of, of the model. Is it John's predicted risk? Okay. So, uh, so we took, you know, so, so, so we used some ordering of this feature, right? But it's important that, you know, this pro process is actually order dependent. The order matters if it's a nonlinear model, okay? So for instance, the impact of John being a day trader, it could be particularly bad if you knew that you're young. You're a young day trader. So what it means is that the impact of the day trader feature could be large if you already know that he's a young, which means that if we reverse the order between age and then occupation, it could be that age is more important and the day trader shrinks, right? So this sharp value, our method, shapely additive explanation values, it tries to average these attributions, basically the lengths of these arrows, okay? Um, over all possible orderings, how many orderings are there? Oh, I already showed it. How many orderings? If you have n features, n factorial, right? Yeah. Okay. And then we showed that in our newest paper at the bottom, this reference, that um, these sharp values are the only possible values which maintain three important properties. It was a theoretical result. And then these properties are really important. That's, you know, these properties are what makes you know, any comparison among these features in terms of their important values are meaningful, okay? And then, um, and then, so it's great, but of course, you know, this is not certainly how you want to actually compute these, val the, 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 these shaft values. Why not? Because what that means is that you have to try all possible orderings, right? It's a lot when, you know, as n grows, it's n factorial. 
So, you know, so the further research needs to be done to develop efficient, efficient machine learning algorithm to actually compute these values. Okay. You know, one way to do this is to do the sampling. Instead of considering all possible O-rings, you just consider, you know, some subset of O-rings, right? Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to get to that a little bit later. All right. So now let's turn to our medical problem. Okay. The um, prescience. So now prescience outputs the risk prediction and then its explanations which shows a set of features that increase the risk, the purple colored ones, and then the set of features that decrease the risk, the green colored. And then the plot at the bottom is equivalent to rotating the feature explanations you're seeing at the top at a certain time point by 90 degrees and then stacking the, uh, these explanations for each time point horizontally. And then you can see that you know, from the risk trend, the large increase in risk at the current time point was driven by tighter volume at this current time point. Okay? And then, um, meaning that a drop in this patient's tighter volume in this case, in this particular case. And actually, uh, hypoxemia happened within five minutes. Okay? So that gives you some insight, you know, clinical insights over what's going on. What is the reason for this hypoxemia? So to test the potential of this oppression system to aid hypoxemia prediction, we replayed the pre-recorded surgery um, from the test data, which were not used by prescience training, in a web-based visualization. It's not actual surgery. We, you know, we did develop a website, and then um, we showed them to uh, five practicing anesthesiologists. So each anesthesiologist provided a risk rate of hypoxemia as compared to a normal acceptable risk for 270 cases. And then these, these relative risks were then used to compute the standard ROC curves, which were then averaged across all five um, anesthesiologists. Okay, so here is the result. So the uh, prediction accuracy of anesthesiologists markedly improved when they were given the prescience risk prediction and its explanations. So, so we are comparing the blue and the green curves. Okay? And then um, and then this result basically suggests that if anesthesiologists currently anticipate 15% of the event when they are not assisted by uh, prescience, if they are assisted by pre prescience, then um, they, they could anticipate 30% of the event. So this suggests that, you know, basically Prescience can improve the anesthesiologist's assessment for future risk and their ability to proactively anticipate this event. Okay. So now then, the natural question is, what happens if we just let the machine learning predict the hypoxemia, AI doctor? Okay. So interestingly, the prediction performance of the anesthesiologist with a pre prescience was slightly lower than direct uh, predictions from prescience. I wouldn't add further comments on this result. <laughs> so let's turn to the next. OK. <laughs> so what next? Are we done? So to further improve the prediction accuracy, you know, doc doctors always want better accuracy. We now focused on the um, time series nature of the data, the data from the uh, patient monitoring system. So for any time series, we know that we need some embedding method that transforms the time series into a set of input features. And then, by the way, the prescience uses a really simple way, uh, simple exponential averages. Okay? Um, and then we developed the phase method, physiological signal embedding method. It's a deep learning based approach using LSTM to carefully extract um, potentially relevant features from raw time series data, and then also in order to um, enable transferring the embedding model between hospitals. So this is actually a really exciting aspect because data sharing can be sometimes be very, really tricky in this domain, you know, this uh, patient data between hospitals. And then by transferring the embedding model learned based on source hospital, say, was well, supposed to have a lot of data, and then we can potentially improve the prediction accuracy in a target hospital that has um, small amount of data, much lower number of you know, samples. 
So, and then we showed that phase can actually improve the uh, prescience method significantly. Okay? We are now testing this for you know, other, sets of, other sets of data sets that are even smaller um, target hospitals. So now, independently, we are also developing machine learning methods to efficiently compute the shaft values for particular model types. We chose three ensembles, Y trees, because it's a extremely popular models. So especially many of the Kaggle competition winners use XGBoost. It's a fast implementation of gradient boosted decision trees, and then. Here's a result of the Kaggle data survey done by a couple thousand data scientists. And then, and then, as you can see, three models are the most widely used model in industry these days. And then we designed a tree algorithm that can reduce the exact computation of the shaft values, exponential number, you know, exp and, and factorial, the, um, the, the all possible ordering from exponential to polynomial time. And then I will show you. And the next slide is that this actually enables exciting applications. Okay. So, and then also as a part of this tree shape work, we developed a rich visualization, um, visual representation of the global importance of the features. We call it shape summary plot. So to explore this visualization, we used the enhanced data from 10,000 individuals who were interviewed and tested in the 1970s and then followed up by for 20 years. We extracted four common measurements from a blood test and then um, demographic values as features for Cox model, Cox professional, uh, pro, proportional hazards model in XGBoost. And then for each individual, not only we predict um, predict the survivor, we also compute the shaft values. So for each shaft, each feature, then, we can visualize its distrib their distribution. So, so here, um, you know, the, the, the plot on the right side, dots represent the shaft values of all individuals. And then they are, they are uh, plotted horizontally and then um, stacked vertically when they are run out of space to show some kind of density. Okay, so it's a the, you know, similar idea as like violin plot, although we don't have to decide anything on the, the kernels or anything. And each dot is colored by the value of that feature from low, blue, and then high, red. Okay, so what it basically shows is that um, unsurprisingly, you know, age is the most important risk factor for uh, death over the, <laughs> over the next 20 years. And then... Um, and then you know the you can see that when you know when the uh, the when you have so the when ha, the age when it's a red value you see the the high shaft value, and then blue um, colored dots correspond to the negative negative um, shaft value for obvious reasons. Right? Okay, so then, then some of these features show rare large effects as well. And then um, overall, many features show long tails reaching to the right, but not to the left. For example, systolic blood pressure um, only has a large impact for minority of people with a high blood pressure. And then this general trend means is that extreme values of these measurements can significantly raise your risk of death, but cannot significantly lower your risk. So, what that means is that there are many ways to die younger, but there are not many ways to be out of a range and live longer. Okay. Makes sense, right? <laughs> okay. Now let's turn to the um, shaft dependence plot. So we focus on each individual feature. Okay. So here it shows the systolic blood pressure. And then the shaft dependence plots use these shaft values of a feature for the y-axis and then the value of the feature for the x-axis. So by plotting these values for many individuals from the data set, we can see how the feature's attributed importance changes as its value varies. Okay, So you can see that in your systolic blood pressure, it actually goes a little up, so low uh, blood pressure and the high blood pressure are bad, okay? Makes a lot of sense. It's actually U shape. I can, you know, that that part it actually goes up a little bit there, okay? So, 
um, it can capture also this vertical dispersion. And then what causes this vertical dispersion? It's interaction between multiple features, right? So um, it's interaction effect. So you know, coloring by age shows that high blood pressure is more alarming um, for when you are younger. You can, you know, if you compare this, you know, blue dots and the red dots, okay? And then it's presumably because it takes time for high blood pressure uh, to lead to fatal complications. Maybe it makes perfect sense, okay? So, and then you can decompose the sharp dependence plot into main effect and then interaction effect. So now, this sham method can also be used explaining prediction errors as well. So we are talking about explaining prediction result, but it can also predict, uh, explain the prediction errors. So how does it work? You know, say that you deploy the machine learning system in practice, okay? And then, you know, like everything else, it can break, right? And then, you know, what's worse, when it breaks, it often just gets less accurate. And then you might even never, you know, even didn't, wouldn't even notice that there is a problem. Okay. So let's say, you know, uh, for example, you, you deploy a system trained to predict the duration of surgeries. And then if you are a careful data scientist, you will monitor the average performance over time. So here it seems to oscillate randomly for three years. So, um, First, we train the model using the first year of data, and then the error increases significantly. This is simply just you know, difference between training and then test error, okay? So in the deployment period, and then you can see it, you know, error still just oscillates, and then, um, and then you would never know, you know, just by looking at this plot, but we, what we actually did was that we intentionally introduced an error after the first year, and then, we actually swapped the label of two operating rooms in the hospital. Not the actual hospital, on the data, okay? So, um, and then this SHAP monitoring plot decomposes the model's loss, the error, among each of the features, and that this allows to see the impact of each of our features on the model's loss over time. So here we see um, that the plotting these sharp values of the model loss for one of the mislabeled rooms actually identifies a clear increase in the model error exactly when this mislabeling happened. Okay, so this tells us three important things we didn't even we didn't previously know about. So the problem exists. Okay, first of all, and then which feature is causing the problem? In this case, the OR, the labels. And then, how much the problem is impacting our model's performance? And then, we believe that these types of mo the monitoring plots can help improve our ability to safely deploy uh, models in practice. Okay. So now, um, yeah, I'm going to skip this example because uh, it's already 30 minutes. So now, let's see how explaining uh, how explainable AI techniques can help cancer biology, and then precision medicine, okay? So say that there is a patient X who has acute myeloid leukemia, it's an aggressive blood cancer, and then like other cancers, there are many anti-cancer drugs this patient can be treated with. And then, but standard cancer therapy is not personalized. And then our goal is to build a machine learning based system that takes molecular profile of a patient and then predict the response to a large number of anti-cancer drugs. And we know that making an accurate prediction, you know, when we, when we use this kind of high dimensional data can be very challenging, okay? We are talking about 20,000 expression levels as features. And then, um, but based on interpretable markers, uh, we, can, you, you know, we can better know why a certain prediction is made, okay? Let me show you an example. So, this um, problem can be seen as a classic supervised learning problem. What does it mean? You know, say that we have this training data from our collaborators in hematology. Um, you know, say we got this a set of you know, features X, in this case is gene expression levels, and an outcome variable Y is in vitro drug sensitivity measure for 160 drugs. 
And then we have a set of a training samples. Let's say it's 2,200 um, primary AML patient specimens. And then using this training data, we can learn a prediction model for each drug so that we can predict a, the, the drug sensitivity of a new patient based on his or her features. But many of the features selected in this manner, in this high dimensional data, are likely to be false positives. And then, you know, if we check how many of the associations are replicated in validation data, the replication rate is normally not very, um, not very high. Okay? And then alternative way is to make it partially unsupervised. So by integrating publicly available high throughput data set generated by multiple AML studies. Still, we, we are going to use the data from AML, not, not you know, other kinds of cancer. So here is a, one way to do this. So we extract gene level features that tells us how likely the gene drives the disease progression so that we can be confidently use them as a gene expression markers for therapeutic response. Okay? It would be most, you know, more likely that the gene needs to be a driver than the genes that does nothing in the, for the disease, right? So we named these gene level features the merge features because each of these letters um, represents a property of a gene that can indicate its potential to be important, potential to be reliable marker for therapeutic response. So here, what would M mean then? Let's start with M. It's a cancer. Uh oh, mutation, yeah? <laughs> okay, how frequently the gene is mutated? We used the TCGAML data to estimate that. And then, and then expression humness. We used a lot of a gene expression data set and then learned the gene expression network and then computed sort of the humness, okay? How many neighbors the gene has in this network? And then whether the gene is annotated as a regulator, is it transcription factor, chromatin modifier, some gene that's known to regulate other genes. Okay, those are important genes. And then CNV, and then also methylation. Okay, so then our merge algorithm combines this information to learn the merge score, such that this score can explain the gene drug associations. Okay, high merge score genes have a lot of, uh, are associated with a lot of drugs. And then, the, and then um, well, the idea is that this merge lets us focus on only explainable associations. Okay? So by using the merge method, the consistency rate, you know, the percent of association, gene drug association replicated in validation data significantly uh, improves in this important region of the x-axis here. The x-axis is the number of the top ranked genes we considered. Okay? And then, we also show that it's better than four alternative methods, and it also the actual prediction performance improves compared to other three alternative approaches, including the Dream Challenge winner. Okay. So details are in our publication. Okay. And then also another exciting aspect is we experimentally validated some of this association. So many of these gene drug pairs identified our method made sense based on known AML biology. And then, you know, one of the novel findings was that um, SMACA4 gene, its overexpression drives sensitivity to these two drugs. And then these drugs are important because they are actually currently used for AML treatments. So, and then um, our collaborator, uh, Pam Becker in uh, hematology was super motivated to experimentally validate this finding. And then we picked um, an AML cell line that shows uh, low SMACA4 expression and then transfected these cells to overexpress SMACA4. And then when you do that, it's not advancing. When you do that, the drug sensitivity um, improves significantly. Okay? Blue original, red is uh, transfected. And then we picked another cell line that originally showed high SMACA4 expression, transfected, uh, and then the drug sensitivity stays the same. Okay. So now, our then next question is how to improve the process of selecting a combination of drugs, not just one drug, because it's important to use multiple drugs at the same time. Combination therapy is known to work much more effectively 
uh, than any single drug. So, um, and then, you know, when, and then when we have a too many choices then, I mean, but this makes our problem harder because now we are talking about tens of thousands of drugs instead of 106 drugs, right? And then, and then when we have too many choices, it's very important to know why or why not certain drug pairs are good options, okay? So we applied our SHAP method for that. So um, in collaboration with Camilla Nexarova at, at Harvard, we are now developing the method we named EXPRESS, Explainable Prediction of Anti-Cancer Drug Synergy. So for each patient and for a particular combination of drug A and B, EXPRESS takes as an input gene expression data and then drug-based uh, information. Okay? So basically, we used um, the drug name based feature, it's a, just hard encoding, and then as well as this, you know, the known targets of these drugs as a drug features. Okay? And then the sharp values will tell us then, you know, which drugs contributed to synergy or not synergy. So we are gonna, you are gonna see the predicted synergy and then as well as this explanations. And then we can then infer the pathway based um, pathway level importance for that particular patient as well. And then um, we used, you know, we trained this express model based on the BIT AML data. It's a Nature uh, 2018 paper, which contains um, 12,000 samples and then from 300 patients and 133 uh, combos. And then um, in terms of the prediction model, we chose XGBoost, an ensemble tree model. It's a complex model, but we don't have to worry about it because we have a shared method. And then another motivation was that it, it was more accurate than linear model or neural network, or, and then also um, the random forest in terms of the cross-validation prediction accuracy. Um, so we have this tree shared method, and then, um, and then you know, the, um, in this particular uh, uh, cross-validation test, we considered four different held out data settings uh, from the easiest setting where you sim simply randomly split the samples and then to the most difficult setting where you made sure, you know, we see only novel patients in the test data set or novel drugs in the test data set, okay? In all settings, um, the XGBoost model does, uh, did the best. So in addition, this X, you know, Express gives us explanations as I said, and here is a sharp summary plot for genes with a positive trend. This means that high expression of these genes usually indicate synergy and then negative trend genes. And then some of these genes are well known to be relevant in AML biology, including mice one a known AML driver, and then DLL3. And then this analysis enabled us to um, perform a pathway enrichment analysis with the goal to find the pathways that could be potentially mechanistic explanation of the anti-cancer drug synergy. Okay? And then we can also do this in a combo specific manner um, uh, with some you know, interesting potential you know, clinical implications. Okay? So, and then, what next? Now we will turn to the next topic uh, focused on general cancer gene expression data analysis. So one of the fundamental changes with the gene expression data is caused by what? Very fundamental nature. <laughs> High dimensionality, okay? So, you know, so you always have 20,000 genes, right? And they use them as features, okay? So it often, you know, the um, generates many uh, False positive findings in downstream analysis and makes results hard to interpret biology, biologically. So we were wondering if there is a, a, a way to use existing gene expression data to improve our current gene expression data analysis and that we came up with a cool AI solution based on the autoencoder model, which uses a neural network to reconstruct, reconstruct the uh, input data. So especially, we focus on the variation of autoencoder, which regularizes the, um, the latent space uh, to be Gaussian distributed. And then uh, still other neural networks, and then VAE has uh, two fundamental problems. Each run results in different network, and then uh, it's not clear how to choose the number of latent nodes. So we propose an ensemble approach, which uses many VAE models, 
uh, with the varying numbers of latent variable, latent nodes, and then you know each run you know like hundred times from different starting points, and then we applied it to uh, each of the eighteen human cancers. So here is how it works for each cancer in this analysis. Um, so we used almost all available gene expression data from GEO, and then we learned cancer-specific latent space for all samples by using the ensemble VAE model. So ensemble means we are using like 600 VAE model with the different uh, numbers of latent variables and then different starting point. This gives us a lower dimensional uh, representation for these samples and then also gene level and pathway level attributions for, um, for our model, the, uh, the latent nodes, and then which will give us a way to biologically interpret each node. Okay? And then, and then, you know, from this, you know, model can also be used for, for people who have a new gene expression data set. And then, and then um, we can reduce the uh, dimensionality of any new gene expression data set, okay? And the because the model is already trained, okay? So, um, and then we evaluated our approach. We named the deep profile, okay, in two ways. First, based on the number of pathways captured, um, the profile captured the largest number of pathways in its latent space compared to four other dimensionality, basic dimensionality reduction methods for most of the 18 cancers, as you can see, it's this red bar. And then, wow. And then second, in terms of how well the resulting latent nodes are informative of various prediction tasks, including um, AML complete remission, and then ovarian cancer histological phenotypes, and then our new, newest analysis, we used uh, survivor data. Okay? In all tasks, we show that deep profile does it better than uh, many of the dimension, other dimensional reduction methods. Okay, so we turn to the next part. If this is the shortest, it will be more like five minutes. So in the second part of the talk, we talked about choosing drugs. And then personalized drug uh, recommendations are only possible when we have a drugs to choose from, which unfor is unfortunately not true for, in the, for the case of Alzheimer's disease. Okay? So it's a sixth leading cause of death and then the only uh, disease among the top 10 deadly diseases in the United States. No cure, no prevention, and no treatment. To reserve our heart, it's a progression. And then critical barriers include the lack of a molecular understanding the molecular basis for 80s um, hallmarks, neuropathological hallmarks, uh, plaques and tangles, whose building blocks, basic bu building blocks are A, beta, and then tau, respectively. Okay? So we, you know, computational biologists often gain insights in terms of molecular basis for phenotype by using gene expression data and then phenotype data. So in this case, it would be neuropathological phenotype data. So here is how a conventional method works. So from each brain, you uh, measure the A-beta level and also gene expression levels. And then you have um, some number of samples, some number of brains, and then uh, that gives you the expression data set and then phenotype data. And then you can find the genes that are relevant to the phenotype by examining the statistical association between the phenotype and each of these genes. Okay, And then um, and then what is the alternative then? We are now developing various deep learning approaches to identify interpretable expression markers based on various sets of prior knowledge on gene functions and in the, and in the disease. And then our initial analysis led to hypothesis that, I'm going to just jump to the, our, our, our hypothesis, I mean, well, the details of our method is in our bioarchival paper. Okay? So, um, we, uh, so our initial analysis led to the hypothesis that um, you know, one or more of the complex one gene, mitochondria complex one genes, uh, play a role in tolerance to A beta toxicity. Okay? And then uh, we validated using the transgenic C. elegans model. So this C. elegans express A beta in its body wall of muscle cells. So which means that it's an AD model of a worm, and then it's age-associated aggregation, which means that um, it results in rapid onset of age-associated paralysis. Okay? A beta is a bad molecule, and then when the, you know, it develops in the, in the muscle, it causes a paralysis. So um, you know, this, at a certain age, this worm will be paralyzed. 
So then the question is then, if you, you knock down the worm ortho log, the genes we identified from our analysis, whether the paralysis will be delayed, meaning whether these worms will become less ill. And then that can prove that the gene of interest plays a role in terms of inducing tolerance to A beta could be AD drug target, could, be a good, uh, could lead to AD drug target. So we are collaborating with Matt Cablin in pathology he has a fantastic worm bot system, so his lab can perform this kind of a paralysis assay for many genes at the same time. So, and then we used RNA and I to reduce the expression level of gene of interest. And then I said that these are the genes that are that form complex one, and then um, observed significant delay in paralysis compared to the oh, okay, compared to the um, you know the animals treated with empty vector control. So then how does it, you know, exactly how it actually looks? So here's the idea. So as you can see, so this is the control, and then this, this is when the worms are treated, okay? And then it becomes clear that the worms under treatment move more lively as time goes, right? So, and then this is consistent with this graph. And then, and then, so, you know, we can say our, approach pinpointed this mitochondrial uh, complex one as a potential mediator of the A-beta uh, produce, produce stasis. And then uh, we didn't actually come up with this hypothesis when we used a simple approach, which is, um, this is based on linear correlation. So is there a drug that, uh, that inhibits complex one? There must be, right? Yeah. So we found that capsaicin is one of them. Maybe it's a good idea to eat more peppers. We haven't tested the capsaicin directly yet. Okay, so in this talk, I presented our new interpretable machine learning techniques, SHAP and more, and then, and then merge, and a few more, and then um, this explainable, uh, very briefly explainable um, expression and the phenotype method. Um, and then I believe that this, you know, exemplifies the importance of advancing machine learning and AI technique. And this, you know, in all of these projects, we used some, you know, new machine learning technique. Um, and then, you know, we hope that it can generate visible impact in the medicine and biology. And then we need to continue to address, you know, these challenges. Um, the, uh, and, and, and solve more problems. So, as I always say at, at the end of my talk, all of the work I presented today was done by my students. Any single graph or you know, plot was generated by me. And I work with 11 fantastic PhD students, including three MSTP students who chose computer science a PhD major, very brave. And then I work with incredibly, uh, incredible supportive collaborators at UW and in other institutions. And then our work was funded by NSF, NIH, and the American Cancer Society. Thank you.